it is wonderful to see so many people here, uh, both lots of folks that I know who come out to a ton of true events and a whole lot of new faces. So uh, for those who don't know, uh, my name is Megan Owens. I'm the director of Transportation Riders United, also known as True. And we have been working for the last almost, well, over 20 years on ways to get more and better public transit and other sustainable mobility options throughout the greater Detroit area. Because we believe that everyone should be able to get where they need to go, regardless of whether they drive. I mean, pretty simple concept, but that transportation, when done right, really, transportation is freedom. Uh, freedom to access excellent uh, whatever sort of schools or jobs uh, uh, or stores that you want to get to. Uh, the freedom to walk or bike or roll just as safely as someone who's behind the wheel of a car. Uh, the, the, the freedom to really have the cho choices in how you get around. Um, and that is why we were so excited uh, when uh, Ray De La Henti told us that he was coming to Detroit and was in willing to do an event with us uh, to talk about Detroit. Um, and as we all know, there will be some good, some bad, some ugly, uh, some exciting. Uh, that tends to be Detroit. I used to, uh, I, I give friends from out of town the, the good, the bad, and the ugly tour. Um, because we've got a, li a little bit of everything. So uh, I want to, uh, to, to take a moment to, to thank everyone for coming out, um, especially True's uh, members and donors. We are a nonprofit organization. The only way we can do what we do, advocating day in, day out for more and better transit, is through the contributions of individuals like you. So. Um, Technically, by buying a ticket, you are now a true member, um, and hopefully that'll, you'll, uh, you'll stay members for, for uh, quite a while, and you'll learn lots more. I'll talk more at the end about different ways to get involved in true and in our work, um, but uh, I think that was, yeah, I think that's it in terms of, oh, I think folks saw beverages, food, there's restrooms right uh, around the corner there. Um, and yeah, we're going to be hanging out here for almost two hours, so make yourself comfortable. Um, we're still good trying to get the second mic working, so we might be doing a little bit of back and forth for a few minutes. But um, I wanted to start uh, by asking Ray, for anyone who may not have seen them, how do you describe your channel and the, and the videos you produce? Uh, I don't even know how to answer that question. <laughs> because, because, well, no, it's, it's funny because it, it has evolved over time. Um, I think, like, right at the beginning, I was like, kind of want to talk about transit and high-speed rail and maybe a little bit of, like, biking stuff. Um, and as it evolved and I, and I started... Uh, my interest started getting peaked in a lot of different directions, and in particular, like housing affordability um, became a big topic. And then I went to Charlotte, North Carolina early last year and made a video while I was there. And I really enjoyed the experience. I got to meet a lot of people, like, like a lot of people working in the local advocacy circles. Um, I got to make a video about Charlotte. I got to hang out in a city that I hadn't been to in a really long time and explore it and think about what makes it special. And I thought, gosh, I should do more of these. And so every, about once a month, maybe every two months, I'll, you know, sometimes I'm going to a city specifically to go film there, but sometimes it's like a family thing or, or some other, uh, like I'm going to a conference or whatever, and so I'll, I'll make a video while I'm in that city. And so, um, so that's been a big part of the, the channel as well. So really, um, it's not the same, like like I release a video every Wednesday, but it's intentionally not the same video every week. Like it has to be somewhat radically different just to keep me interested. I don't know what keeps you guys interested, <laughs> but for me to be able to keep doing a channel, I have to do something very different every week. So if I did a top 10 list one week, you're almost certainly not getting a top 10 list. You're gonna get some sort of issue issue driven video or somewhere where it's more like a travel log where I visited a city and, and, and try to identify the things that make it interesting or unique. So so that's why I have a hard time answering the question because it, it, it's a channel that's not necessarily really about one thing. There are a lot of themes that run through 
all of the videos, but um, the approach I take really is different from week to week. That's great. No, I, 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 that makes a lot of sense. That it, it isn't going to be interesting if it's always the same thing. And even just looking at, I mean, I think you, you, you referenced it as urbanism, uh, but that's such an incredibly broad topic. I was, uh, you, you worked as a professional transportation planner for more than a decade. Um, how did you make the transition into creating videos? Um, it, it really is a, it's really a pandemic story more than anything else. Um, because I had been working in, I worked in the public sector for a few years. I worked for the Oregon Department of Transportation in Multnomah County, where Portland's the seat of Multnomah County. I, I was their bicycle and pedestrian coordinator. Um, and then I, I, get, I got headhunted by a consulting firm. And so I ended up working in consulting for like, 10, 10, 11 years, I think. Um, and when the pandemic came around um, and they moved us all to work from home, um, that that kind of wore on me a little bit. And then there were some other things that happened, uh, kind of personal things during the pandemic that made me realize I need to just take some time off and, and rethink what I'm doing. And it's probably a sabbatical and I'll go back and do my old job again in like three or six months. Um, but one of my ideas for what to do at that time was um, I had this notebook of ideas that I'd, um, I'd been uh, adding to every once in a while for, um, for several years because when you're in consulting, there, there are the projects that clients will pay you money to research and, and plan and, and, um, and document. Um, and then there are things that nobody will ever pay you to do. And so I had a list of like all the topics that were interesting to me personally, but nobody was gonna pay me to talk about. But that's all I'll do with my free time. I'll talk about the things that I, I find personally interesting and that are informed by you know the work that I did in my career. And the first idea was, oh, well, I'll blog. But that just sounded, blogging sounds terrible to me. Like I just didn't <laughs> wanna do that. Um, and I'd been watching a little bit of YouTube and I thought, well, I could make YouTube videos. I've got like a little bit of like video production deep, like way back in my background. <laughs> um, and so that kind of came into play. So that, that convinced me I could actually make videos. So I just started making videos while I was on my sabbatical thinking nobody's gonna watch these and I'm gonna go back to work in a few months. But after a few weeks, like I remember getting an email, you have a subscriber. <laughs> so I had one subscriber, like there's one person out there who likes what I've what they've seen enough? Like I can't even imagine because the, the the quality on on those first videos is even lower than what they do now. Like it's really <laughs> bad. Um, and uh, it's like somebody thought enough of that that they clicked a button that said, "Yeah, I want to see more of that." When whenever he gets around to making another video, and and then it just kind of grew from there. Once I had one subscriber, it's like, oh yeah, there must be something there. And so they just kind of kept coming. And like after a couple months, I was like gosh, like I'm not really making any money, but I can, I can kind of see there's a trajectory and I should probably just keep doing this and not go back to work. And I don't know, so that's, that's what I did. <laughs> I mean, it is work, right? It's my new job. It's my new job. Yeah. That's fine. Excellent. Well, we are so excited that you came here to, uh, to Metro Detroit area. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us both a little bit about what spurred you to, to come here and um, What's your impression? Um, you've been here since Monday. What what have you seen? And um, yeah, what are, well, yeah? What's your impression so far? Oh, that was like that was like five different questions. Okay. So <laughs> that's fine. Um, yeah. So so what spurred me to come out here in the first place? Well, first of all, um, a, a couple of the folks here in your organization did email. Um, like at the end of last year, I think, and I just couldn't fit anything into my schedule at that point. And, but, but thank you to Aaron and Stanley for the uh, inspiration there. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it was one of those things where like, it was a very well-crafted email that kind of made the pitch for why it's a good idea for you to come to Detroit. And like, there's, there's all the things that are going on. It's like, yeah, that is a pretty good pitch. And so I kind of kept that in my back pocket um, for a while. And then, I don't know. So. It, uh, fast forward to, I don't know, June, June or July of this year. I kind of, um, so I have like a Patreon. And so I put a post up on my, for my patrons saying, hey, you guys are like paying me money every month. I want to use your money to go um, 
go travel to a city where nobody's paying me to go to. Like a lot of the times I go to a city, someone's paying me for me to go do a speaking gig or a conference or something like that. And and I said, I just wanted to go to a city and have it be my idea and 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 I just have my own agenda. What what city are you guys most interested in seeing me cover? And Detroit was the most mentioned city. Like yeah. yeah. And so I think it was, um, yeah, because who needs another video about like New York or <laughs> LA or something? Um, and so you guys can think about like what that means and and why that is. Like I don't I don't I don't think there's anyone. Everybody everybody has their own reasons. Oh, number two was uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, and I might go there too, but we'll cool. see we'll see what what February, what time. Maybe. Yeah, maybe February. <laughs> um, and I have been to San Juan, and I know I know it would be fascinating to film and and. I don't know, whatever. Um, so, so Detroit, yeah, people, uh, be, because like a lot of people haven't haven't been here or they don't come here um, because they saw stories, you know, yesterday or ten years ago or twenty years ago or forty years ago, um, and they thought, I don't know, like maybe that's not a place I want to go visit. But I think you increasingly see things um, about like redevelopment or whatever, and, 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 and you start to hear different different stories. So I think people are like slightly confused about Detroit. <laughs> and I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can help resolve that confusion <laughs> for them in, in the three days that I have there. But there's so many fascinating uh, contrasts. And also I know, um, you know, because I make videos, there, they have to be things that are interesting visually. And Detroit is such a visually interesting place. So just to kind of get to some of my impressions. So one thing that's striking, even if you just like uh, view it from like an aerial or whatever, is just how unique the, the downtown street layout is. I think that's that's one thing that's, um, I don't know, because most American cities just have a, a straight up grid and grids are okay, but, but there's something about having every viewpoint down the street have some sort of interesting angle or a building at the end of it. And there are so many beautiful buildings, like old Art Deco beauties downtown. So, so there's, there's, a lot, um, there's a lot to recommend downtown. And I know that um, it, it could be a, a mixed bag as far as the way um, things have, have redeveloped and, the, and you know, the, the type of culture or whatever. But, um, but I mean, I, I hung out, it was around noon yesterday at like lunchtime around like um, campus marshes. There's a ton of people out there. And I did get here just in time for the tail end of the jazz festival. And that was amazing too. So um, so downtown, great. Um, and I've gotten to, <laughs> one thing that, that really surprised me was I, I find this to be a pretty like friendly city compared to what I was expecting. Um, so I've been using the MoGo to get around quite a bit. It doesn't get to as many places as, as I would like to be able to get, but but it, it's a little more expansive than I probably was expecting. I've definitely been to cities where the bike share system is really just kind of downtown, right? And and you can get to more more places here. Um, I, did, it, <laughs> I did not manage to bike all the way from like New Center to the avenue of fashion because I don't know if you can do it. Um, yeah, can can yeah. you do it? Uh, the most, uh, yeah, once once I got north of like Grand, I'm like, how do, how do I how do I get to the next place? I don't know. Um, but I did take the bus up up to uh, seven mile, eight mile um, earlier today, um, nice. and I don't know. Like, there's just some fascinating things going on, and then there's no doubt. Like as you walk around neighborhoods it's just so interesting to um, god i mean i went to what boston edison like the mansions are just incredible and yeah. they'll go on other blocks and like like there's just em it's empty or, or there are farms or whatever yeah. and it's all it's all kind of sitting side by side a little bit yeah. anyway but these are just things you, like you don't yeah. you don't really i don't know you don't you don't see it to anywhere near the same extent and in other cities, so that's always kind of the thing I'm looking for when I when I come to cities. What's 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 here that I just can't see anywhere else? 
And there's a lot of things like that in Detroit. Absolutely. I know that you've been uh, largely getting around by walking, biking, or by transit. Um, how well has the transportation worked out for you? Um, any challenges, any uh, uh, impressions on the, the transportation options? Yeah, so, so often when I do this, um, I really want to get around without, like I never rent a car for sure, and then I try to avoid using Uber as much as I can, just out of principle, I just kind of to be consistent with like, the ethos of, of the channel and what I do. And so that usually means a lot of walking because that's, I find that's the best way to really yeah. see places. Um, the problem with Detroit is a lot of the things I'm really interested in are far away from each other. <laughs> so like I wanted to go to Hamtramck yesterday um, and I did, but it, it took up a lot of my time because <laughs> Because I biked as far as I could bike, and I just walked the rest of the way, and it's like, okay, there went like three hours of my day just <laughs> just getting to and from. But I mean, it's worth it. But but it, make, it makes you wish there were more convenient, uh, frequent options to yeah. get to get between these different super interesting places. Um, so, but again, yeah, like like as far as like places that are walkable or bikeable from downtown, which is where I'm staying. I mean, I mean, there, there are lots of them in, in every direction. Um, so, but, but I really didn't want to limit, didn't want to limit myself to, to just the places I could walk or bike to, just because I, don't, I didn't think I would be doing the region or the city justice if I did that. And so, so I tried to, I tried to, um, yeah. So like I took the 16 up to like seven mile today. And actually it doesn't go all the way to seven mile. It gets close, like six blocks short. So. Excellent. Um, yeah, and obviously you can only get, we talked earlier, we can only, you can only get a tiny taste of, of the city in, in a couple of days, but it sounds like you, you've uh, managed to hit a lot of the, the highlights. Um, we know that Detroit's got a lot of work to do in terms of urban planning and transportation. Was there anything that really stood out to you as uh, particularly poor or, or Horrific, uh, somebody asked. Um, yeah, what was the most uh, uh, most uh, surprising or disturbing thing you've seen about Detroit? And then we'll get to the good. We'll shift over to the good very soon, but I do want to hear any uh, of the problems that you noted. Oh, gosh. And, and I, if you watch my channel, I, I really do try to keep it glass half full. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know. I mean, like, like and again, like I, I haven't I haven't been to all the parts of Detroit you would want to be able to get to in order to give an informed response to that question. So I'm sure there are a lot of like horrible things <laughs> I could have seen, um, but I probably didn't. I probably didn't necessarily go to those places. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like I saw vacant lots, and I hate to use the word blight. I, th I think that's like a really loaded word um but but there's a lot of underutilized land um there are a lot of really wide roadways i'm thinking i'm thinking of like four lane one-way roads like you know brush or john r or whatever i was walking around that area but uh what is that so it's, it's boston edison but it, and it, essentially i walked from like ham to boston edison yesterday. Okay. i just kind of walked through that whole area and they're just literally like four lane four lane roadways that are practically empty um and it's just interesting because you know you can look at like the population trajectory of detroit and we all know it's it's um you know it's declined um it's actually back up a little bit i believe but um but along with that you know you, you can kind of see that the roadway network was built with a certain population in mind, right? When you do transportation planning and modeling, you always assume the population's gonna go up. So you can kind of tell there were thoughts that like this this would be a metro area of like 10 million right now, right? And so we need all these wide roadways and, and yeah. that's why they built them. And now there's kind of a question of, and, and this is really for the city, it's like, okay, well, it's, it didn't really work out like that. But on the plus side, we have these amazing opportunities, right? There's there's, there's all this right away we can figure out what to do with. And I can see that the city has done some, some retrofitting um, 
and some changes. Um, so I don't know. Like I find that fascinating. Like yeah. you, know, you can look at it and say, oh, yeah, that's horrible. That's bad. They shouldn't have built it like that. But you can also say, wow, like this this city has opportunities like like no other city has. Yeah, that we that that is that certainly comes up a lot. That there's just so much opportunity. A lot of cities, there's there's so much so little space that that I mean, obviously everybody complains about taking any space, taking space away from cars. Um, and and I prefer to think about reallocating space for multiple users uh, like bus lanes or bike lanes or wider sidewalks. Um, yeah, it's, it's something I definitely thought about on my, on my bus trip today because it's like, it's like an hour um, to get up to the Avenue of Fashion on the, on the 16. Um, and I was <laughs> that thinking, one really meanders yeah, through the neighborhoods. Like, gosh, there should be a, I don't know, there, there should be a better option for getting up there. The frequency wasn't too bad. Like it was running like every 15 minutes. Like I'd like to see better, but, but 15 minutes is not, it's not too bad. But, but the actual time that the trip took, um, it just seemed like, uh, I don't know. I, it seems like there should be something better than that. Yeah. Understood. Understood. Um, uh, so we know that despite some severe challenges, financial crises, population, that Detroit's made some huge steps forward recently. Were there any things that really seemed like very positive features uh, or things you were really impressed by as you've been exploring? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. So, so one thing is, um, and th this was, uh, I, I think the reason I do what I do is because cities, cities impact me in kind of an emotional way. Um, even like everybody's impacted by like their hometown. Like you have, you have emotional attachments to the place where you grew up and the place that you care about. But I, I just get emotional about cities in general. <laughs> um, and there was something about uh, walking up Michigan through Corktown. I went there last night and I'd forgotten or like I hadn't made the connection that that's where Tiger Stadium was. And I passed by, um, what do they call it? The corner, the corner park or the yeah. corner ballpark. And there was there was like a was it like a high school baseball game or like a like a junior college baseball game or, or something like that going on and so yeah it was the, there's the, the police athletic league yeah. the groups use that use the field for uh, for they keep using the field for baseball which yeah. was not a guarantee when that was when right. that was moved exactly. out but it was a a big win yep. um, to 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 enable that to continue yeah yeah and so just seeing that and then I realized oh this used to be like kind of the ballpark. Right. This is where the bars used to be, or you would go before or after like a Tigers game or whatever. Now, like, okay, now I see that. And then I walked a couple more blocks and, and there was Michigan Central Station, right? And the park there, which is gorgeous. Um, so I don't know like all the things that are happening with the station right now, but it looks, I mean, it looks beautiful. I don't know, like, I don't know, uh, obviously um, Amtrak. Uh, is served out of a different facility these days, <laughs> but but I, I don't know. Like I love old train stations. I love old train yeah. stations. I love old ballparks. R.I.P. Tiger Stadium. <laughs> um, I'm with you. Yeah, and so uh, I don't know. Like like it's always a mixed bag uh, when when there's redevelopment. You know, um, there are questions about gentrification and and who who's benefiting. Um, but I I don't know. Like. Michigan in, through Corktown seemed like it was in pretty positive shape as far yeah. as what they've at least what what they've been able to preserve as far as the footprint of the ballpark and and that they've preserved um, the Michigan Central as well is is good to see. Absolutely, I, I like what you were saying in terms of cities can really evoke emotion um, and and yeah the emotion of seeing. Kids in the middle of the city playing ball um, on a oh, yeah. and the, and parents like tons of parents yeah. out there right watching their kids right. in in the in this place where there was there was so much history and so a little bit of the the patina of that history I feel like is is maybe still there you know the structure's yeah. gone yeah you know, these old stadiums old stadiums are are terrible in a lot of ways they're decrepit right like, I've been to bad old stadiums but you lose a lot when when you lose I don't know like. Like, are, are they ever going to tear down, like, Wrigley or Fenway Park? Like, <laughs> probably not. Um, sure hope not, yeah. yeah. 
Um, uh, speaking of stadiums, um, I was uh, re-watching re re a number of your videos uh, to see, it was interesting to see uh, the times that Detroit has come, has come up. And in case folks ha need a, uh -oh. a primer of which videos to check out, um, that uh, Detroit is on the lists of um, underrated cities that really matter in 2024 politically. Um, and, and he does specifically say, seriously, just go to Detroit. <laughs> I'm like, yes, um, great ur urbanism can be affordable. Uh, we were an honorable mention uh, at I think number 12, but that, there, that the city has great bones for biking and walking. Um, we were also on the US metro areas where taking the bus or rail may crush your, your soul, <laughs> which I think we can all relate to. Um, and the dishonorable mention in the cities that brim with vitality that lots of people are moving to. Uh, but, uh, so those were, I don't think anyone would disagree uh, on most of those, but you also noted cities that do sports venues the best. Uh, and then the city really gets an A for central placement, especially recognizing where some of the, uh, the stadiums used to be way out um, in the Northern exurbs. Uh, Auburn Hills, right? Yeah. I mean, the Pistons won championships there, right? So, the, yeah. so there, there's, yeah, that, but, that, that's nice. But, um, <laughs> and then you noted that, well, uh, well, not pe well, not great pieces of downtown architecture they get points for bringing people into the heart of the city. Any thoughts on, on Detroit's uh, stadiums and the, the stadium district, uh, the area around it? Yeah, I do like to go to ball games when I when I come to town. I just didn't time my trip right for, for the Tigers at all. Um, so that would have been good. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Like I'll, I'll have to think about it a little more. The, the, I, I did do a video a couple of years ago where I, where I kind of ranked. Um, I don't know if I called it like the most urbanist ballpark, but the ballparks that had that the meshed the best with like the adjacent urban fabric and that were in walkable areas and well well connected to transit. And I don't think um, I don't think Comerica did particularly well on that. I don't know. <laughs> it's just it's just not like that. That that's kind of the, the kind of the the um, the emotion I felt walking by where Tiger Stadium was. Like, that's such a great location. That, yeah. That's such a great location for a ballpark. And and, and where Comerica Kimer is should be a great location. It's just, there's, there's so many, like, surface parking lots. And, I know. And stuff like that. It's just not, it just doesn't mesh with, with, with all, all the all the other good stuff that's, I mean, like, Woodward's, like, a block away, right? I, mean, I don't know. And, and, and there's just, like, a bunch of, like, if, if the Tigers aren't playing, right, then there's there's just nothing, it's just this huge dead zone, so. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, I, I've certainly noted there's a lot of things Detroit really almost gets right, <laughs> uh, gets 90% of the way there, but then but then falls short on. Um, and yeah, in some ways, the state, having all the stadiums right downtown is great, but uh, enabling more people to get to them without having to have all the surface parking. Um, there are a ton of different questions that people have submitted. I've mentioned a couple of them already. Um, there, someone, uh, John in Detroit asked, what are your thoughts on land value tax and how much influence do you think land value tax has on surface parking lot owners, um, particularly in downtown areas? Are there similar alternatives uh, that you've seen in other cities to encourage surfing, surface parking lots to be developed? Any thoughts on in that area? Yeah, I'm not a. Um, I, I've had many requests to to do a video about land value tax, and it's just one <laughs> of those things where, um, like, the topic itself is interesting, but it, but it's hard for me to think about how to make it visual. Um, yeah. Uh, so um, yeah, like my my planning background is is transportation. I'm a kind of transportation planner and engineer, so I'm not as well versed on land value tax um, as I could be. Um, but but I think it's generally that, like like when you when you when you pay property taxes usually you get taxed for the land and for the structure and land value tax says well the land is the important thing to tax right because that can um, that can spur uh, that can spur you to think about how to better like like if you're if you're getting taxed on the structure and your structure isn't worth it or you don't have a structure at all then you're getting a big tax break right and then you don't necessarily have a lot of motivation to 
to, to develop something more appropriate uh, to um, you know whatever whatever's envisioned for in the like the comprehensive plan of the city for example um, so yeah like I don't have strong feeling like I've heard okay. mixed things about where land value sure. tax is at in the Detroit area it, it's probably the it's probably the large U.S. region that has grappled with the idea the most um, but I haven't researched really kind of where that is right now understood i mean it would be it would be unfair to expect you to be an expert on everything so i'm not an expert on anything so. <laughs> all right you got a lot of a lot of opinions and fun snark so uh that we can appreciate um uh one of the other questions that came in is what can young people do to start a career in urban planning uh, any feedback for, for our students in the audience? Just don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you should. Uh, I actually, um, I mean, I, I enjoy what I'm doing now more, but uh, I, yeah, like I think most, most there, there, are, there are rough days. There are days when you don't want to get out of bed because you can't stand the thing you're gonna have to do later that day at work. But I think it's, it's that way with lots of jobs. And, and far more frequent are the days where like you really enjoy the work you're doing and you do feel like you're making a positive difference. So um, it's something that, uh, that I came around to later. Um, I actually started in civil engineering as an undergrad and I switched to English literature. <laughs> so <laughs> not the best career move, but uh, anyway, but, but I think, I think um, that, uh, that passion and interest in civil engineering kind of came full circle when I went back to grad school in urban and regional planning. Um, and so I would just say like, uh, you can get into planning school with an English degree. Um, it's probably not your best option. Most people come into it with like poli sci or geography or community development. You usually do have to get a master's to, to kind of um, to really, to really be able to enter the planning field, um, but I have met people who 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 are able to catch on with a bachelor's as well. But it's usually in something very specific, like public planning and policy or community development. Um, so, yeah. And then um, there's just kind of the question of: Do you want to work in the public sector? Or do you want to do consulting? Or do you want to do like nonprofit advocacy work? Usually, those are the three the three options for where you're going to go with um, with a planning degree. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I my my feelings toward the profession are positive. I know there are a lot of um, there are a lot of criticisms of what planners do, and and that's fair. Um, but not all planners are like that. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, and I think that's a great point uh, that. Just like anything, uh, the planning profession can do great things or can cause trouble. Um, and I think that was something that that I learned early on is that the the infrastructure we have, the transportation, the cities we have, were made by conscious decisions. People were making decisions for a reason. Um, now, were they the right decisions to benefit the breadth of people who who need it not always but but yeah it's all it's all ultimately decisions by individuals um and uh speaking of i want to broaden our uh our discussion a little bit uh we are in addition to of course having ray here um uh, I'm going to give him a moment to, <laughs> to, ca to catch his breath. And we have uh, three excellent um, community leaders uh, that who are joining us for, for the panel, and we'll hear a little bit from. Um, so I'd love to invite up uh, Wayne County Deputy Executive Asad Turfey, uh, Detroit City Councilman Scott Benson, and RTA Program Director Melanie Piana. So please come on up. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah, if you want to grab a I just if you want to sit in those three there, yeah. I'll move down here. Um 
Um, so yeah, I wanted to each each one of you uh, have a distinguished career in uh, helping shape our cities and our region uh, in in different ways. And I wanted to uh, ask each of you to give a few opening remarks, um, sharing a little bit about um, what what's your what your role is. Sorry, I'm trying to make sure I've got my notes sorted. Um, and uh, and what what improvements uh, in the metro re Detroit region that, that you're most proud of? So if you guys each want to take a, a couple minutes to introduce yourselves. I'll go to first to the elected official. <laughs> hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, so number one, my name is Councilman Scott Benson. I represent the Northeast side of Detroit, and it's an honor and privilege to be here this evening. And I'm really impressed with the number of people who decided to come learn about urbanism and transit in the metro area on a, what is it, a Thursday night? Yeah, a lovely... Where the sun is still out and it's relatively warm outside. So number one, give yourselves a round of applause <laughs> for being willing to come out here and hang out with us. So I'm a huge advocate of cycling. I'm a huge advocate of non-motorized transit and just transit in general. And I'm a firm believer that we in the metro area, especially in the city of Detroit, really need to prioritize and focus on those items if we want to be a competitive region and a competitive city moving forward. Because when you talk about cycling, when you talk about mobility, when you talk about public transit, those are the things that really make you an attractive municipality where people want to come. And so as a city councilman for Detroit, I'm always thinking of how are we being competitive? How am I attracting the next generation? How am I attracting the next residents? And then what do we have that gives us a competitive advantage over our suburbs, over other cities and other states? And so some of the things that have been talked about here this evening, as far as affordability, as far as walkability, as far as our architecture, just the sense of place that you have in Detroit, we have a competitive advantage. Obviously, there's some areas for improvement, and we have lots of upside. And I always like to think of it as there's tons of upside to what we have here in the city of Detroit. But as an avid cyclist, we've got great roads, we've got great areas to ride, and we have a firm and very competitive uh, cycling culture that, that rises from uh, speed drop handlebars, like I like to ride, to people on custom bikes who like to ride as well. And so, but just for me, one of the most, one of the things I'm most proud of as a city council person has been our ability to transform the culture of Detroit. When I got this job, we didn't have any bike lanes. Bike lanes were a very political issue and I fought and I fought and I fought. And we now see people investing in bike lanes. We now have half a billion dollars in non-motorized pathways being built or under construction. Thank you. In the city of Detroit, that's also in partnership. And so that's in partnership with uh, Wayne County, it's in partnership with the feds. And so people are buying in to how we make Detroit and our region more competitive and non-motorized transit is part of that to the tune of half a billion dollars. I just want you to let that sink in how far we have come as a city and as a region. Thank you, Councilman. So uh, thank you, Megan, for putting this on and welcome to Detroit, Ray. Uh, glad to have you. Thank you for all for coming out to have this conversation. So my name is Asad Turfey. I am the <clears throat> Deputy County Executive for Wayne County. Uh, I started off my career in Wayne County 22 years ago. I was an entry level uh, Sheriff's Deputy. I was a police officer. I took the, the transit bus down to 600 Randolph, which is the old county building, applied for a job, and uh, 22 years later and nine promotions, here I am. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nine promotions, yep. So uh, growing up, I grew up in a household uh, where my family really have much access to anything. And we didn't own a car until I was 16 years old. So everywhere we had to go, it was if we caught the bus or where our two feet took us. And... Uh, for most of my childhood, we left the city that I grew up in, which was the city of Dearborn we're in right now. I think I could count on one hand how many times I actually left the city. And wow. it's because we didn't have the means and the transportation to get out. And when, when you ask me what I am you know, most proud about is where I see our development as a region uh, from where it was 22 years ago to where it's at today, it's a big difference. 
Uh, I remember, you know, just as simple as uh, you mentioned downtown Detroit. You know, just 15 years ago in downtown, when you went downtown during the day, you had to worry about having your car broken into. That's no longer the case. And, you know, you have the means of being able to get around. Uh, Detroit was on the, went through bankruptcy and Wayne County was on the brink of bankruptcy. And in Wayne County, we were able to avoid all that. We went from junk bond status to, we just got another upgrade last week. We're at double A now. And, 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 and for the common folk, that's a big deal. What that means is we got a good credit score now. And when municipalities have a good credit score and they got to go out and bond and loan money to do big infrastructure type projects, we get it for a cheaper deal, which means your dollars, your taxpayer dollars go a lot further and we're not paying it in taxes and interest. Uh, I think this is a great conversation. Uh, looking forward to get into the, the discussion even further, but thank you for putting this on. Thank you. I am also the former mayor of Ferndale. Mm -hmm. um, I was elected for 14 years and I decided in December, well, last year, I got hired by the Regional Transit Authority and I had seven months overlap while I was still mayor. Um, but I decided to end my elected service so I could work on something I'm deeply passionate about, which is trans transit um, and mobility in general. I am like Councilman Benson. I'm an urban planner who ran for office. <laughs> um, and this is where I think um, more people who are interested in making these changes in their community need to run for office. Um, and it's everybody in this audience who show up at their council meetings and support types of projects that help advance your city, your street, your neighborhood forward um, to make it safer and more accessible um, in your community. And Detroit is the leader now. I would say when I started urban planning school at Wayne State in 2020 or 2004, um, that it was a very different scenario about what was possible um, in changing our landscapes, not only in Detroit, but across the region. And the amount of progress, I think, individually uh, Detroit has made, but also from the entering suburbs as well, including Dearborn and what they're trying to do, there is this huge effort going forward and elected officials every day are battling it out to change their streets to perform better for all people, not just um, car efficient travel. So this idea that we can have better places. And my proudest accomplishment is putting Woodward on a lane reduction. And then I would say that it takes a village to do something like that. And ultimately, though, what made it happen was years of residents saying they wanted safer access to get across the damn road um, in our downtown and that they wanted better ways to get around and not feel so threatened by the speed of cars on narrow sidewalks in our community. And it was two communities coming together, Pleasant Ridge and Ferndale, both councils were unanimous for multiple years together. And I think that is what has been made that possible. And I think that's what we need going forward. And if I may slip in a second accomplishment, <laughs> is really the bike lanes between Ferndale and Detroit on Livernoy. We were the first entering suburb to break the eight mile barrier of showing connection. And that connection I think has really um, resulted in a significant investment in both communities on both sides of eight mile on Livernois. Yeah, and all of my residents, well, I can't say my residents anymore. I still talk <laughs> as if I'm mayor. It's still your community. It's still right? my community. Um, is that they desire the type of safety treatment on Livernois, um, in Detroit, on Woodward and other streets. And so I think the model, um, Detroit has thrown down the model other people want. I love it, excellent. Uh, and Melanie did really work incredibly hard and fought a lot of battles 
that she shouldn't have had to fight in order to get those lanes. Um, and I can say I personally last week was on the Livernois uh, bike lanes riding from Detroit into Ferndale. Um, and it's, it's wonderful to be able to, to have the options um, when a place is only a mile and a half from my house to, to not have to get in the car. Um, now to figure out how to get the Livernois bus to continue a little bit further. But um, I wanted to uh, ask one, uh, another for our, our um, officials panel, um, I guess our public, yeah, our public officials of some way, shape or form, um, <laughs> not all elected officials, but um, what, what do you see next? Um, what's your, your vision or your goal or what uh, are you working on right now to, to continue to improve uh, the, the Metro Detroit community? I'll go first as I have the mic. <laughs> um, what, so Oakland County last year or two years ago uh, did a ballot initiative where they went all in uh, transits through SMART. So SMART is the main bus service. That, that was a big deal for Oakland. Macomb was already all in. Wayne County currently right now, we have uh, opt-out communities. There's, 20, there's 43 communities in Wayne County total. 26 of them receive SMART uh, bus services. 17 of them don't receive bus services from SMART. 16 out of the 17 don't receive any bus services from any major lines uh, running through their communities. So what are we doing? There is uh, an old law that was written in 1986, Public Act 196 of 1986. This is the law that allows for the creation of the Wayne County Transit Authority. We use the Wayne County Transit Authority to levy the smart millage that goes under your ballot for Wayne County residents once every four years. The problem with that law is it allows local communities to opt out. And what has happened is uh, 17 of those communities have elected to opt out of the smart bus services. Now, that may have made sense in 1986. It no longer makes sense today. So what we're doing is we're working with our state legislature to amend that law, to remove the ability from local leaders to opt out of transit. And then we're going to give that power to the people and let the people decide through an election on what they want in Wayne County. And for us to have a real transit discussion in Wayne County, the first step is to do that and to go all in. And I can tell you this, we're going to work tirelessly and we are going to get it done. We have a target date by the end of the year, this year, hopefully, to be able to have that legislation and law passed and the governor signed. And then step two would be to work with all 43 of our communities to sit down with SMART, to sit down with DDOT in Detroit and figure out how we could connect all these communities together for a brighter future. I just wanna say having a regional transit system will also make us so much more of a competitive region and competitive city, something, something that we're looking forward to and gonna be 100% behind you all when that initiative comes forward. And so something from, that I'm working on right now was more along the lines of micro-mobility. So during the pandemic, what we saw in Detroit were unfortunately people were literally dying in the streets. But we also had essential workers who did not work or did not live near where they worked. And as essential workers, many of them just didn't have the financial resources to afford quality, reliable transportation. And so they, rel they relied on the bus. By that time, the bus was also very dangerous. People didn't know how COVID worked. We saw people getting sick. And if you're an essential worker and you get sick, you may not have health insurance. And so it was really a precarious situation. So my office started something called Bikes for Essential Workers, where we were working with Henry Ford Health System, with the city of Detroit, and a number of other employers and we said, we will provide your employees with a bicycle if they live within five miles of their office to get them to work safely and we'll do it for free. And so over the last five years working through our program, we are now a finalist for a United Way grant of $1.2 million to help scale that out. 
Now we've taken it to a point where we're now actually looking at how can we get, we call the, now the program is called Bikes for Employees. How can we get more people on bicycles within the city of Detroit year round? And we still give bikes away, but we've now shifted the model as well, where we look at electric bikes for people. I'm, 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 I have my priorities and I have, um, I just have a very strong feeling about analog bikes, but I, I can't, assert that feeling to everybody, and it's not for everybody, but transportation and reliable transportation is so important that now we've taken to a model where we now have employers who have said, we will do a payroll deduction of $25 per pay period, and we will give the person, basically we are gonna front and take all the risk as an organization to provide you with a quality electric bicycle to get you to and fro work. We've now given bicycles to mothers, single mothers who have two children to get them to work on electric cargo bikes. And so this has changed the game for so many people. It's not cheap, it's expensive, but it's necessary. And we as a city of Detroit, we need to become more of a 12 month cycling city. And it's done in so many other places. It's done in Europe, it's done in Chicago, it can be done here. We just need to assist and help people so that's something I'm working on right now is making sure that people get out of their cars, get on their bicycles. And there's just so many just ancillary improvements that go along with that, your health, your quality of life, your mental being. Uh, it helps the environment, but it also gets people to work reliably, which is a huge issue for us here in the city of Detroit, where about 30% 30, 30 of our residents do not have access to reliable transportation. And so it also helps the economy and it makes people viable workers in our economy and it helps move people up and it changes their lives. That's something that we're working on right now. And that's a pet project out of my office. I really applaud your efforts. Uh, I'm an e-bike owner and I actually commute from Ferndale up Livernoy all the way to downtown Detroit at Campus Marshes Park for work. I take the bus and I commute by bike, um, depending on weather. Um, I am going to sort of change my hat and talk about the Regional Transit Authority, which I think a lot of you um, are wondering, um, what do we do and uh, how are we advancing um, our region forward to improve transit experience for riders and future riders? The RTA was really designed to do four things. Um, it's fund, plan, collaborate and accelerate. Um, it is in our state legislation. That is what we are supposed to be doing on behalf of the region. And so we are responsible for developing a regional transit master plan, actually a lot of planning, um, including a coordinated human services transportation plan. It's a mouthful, but really it is um, designing and improving our transit system for seniors and people with disabilities. Um, we also do tech planning, um, I really truly like to say uh, we're really focused on three things around these, um, the four things that we do, um, plan, fund, coordinate, and accelerate. But it really is about service improvements, infrastructure improvements, and technology improvements is that what we're trying to do and, um, on all those fronts. And we are making progress and you're starting to see that progress. Um, and I always say, wearing my local hat, is that local infrastructure is regional transit infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So we need to um, think about that as part of improving all three aspects of the transportation system. So we have had progress on the um, coordination side, is that our role is to bring all the transit providers together and say, how might we better integrate our services and address some of these shared challenges across providers, which is the DDOTs and SMARTs in Ann Arbor, uh, the RIDE in Ann Arbor um, is a few. And we are also looking at accelerating and doing proof of concepts, which show demand for ridership, which you have probably heard of them is D2A2, which is the downtown to Ann Arbor um, express bus. <laughs> And you are also part of the Detroit Airport Express, finally getting a fast bus from downtown Detroit to the uh, uh, airport. 
So that is our role and also bring funding in, not only funding for the whole regional system, but how do we unleash and unlock more state funding to go after more federal funding? Um, you need match dollars for grants in order to bring that down. But ultimately, our goal is really to really build out bus rapid transit on the four major corridors, which is Woodward, Gratiot, Washtenaw, and Michigan Avenue, which connects all of our communities. So we're really about making stronger connections to people and places, and the people are the riders of all of these different systems. And I know we have a lot of work to do, and you are here because you care about that work. And when a road is up for repaving in a community such as Ferndale, which is Woodward Avenue, you can put bus infrastructure down when you repave. So you're making and building blocks over time that lead to a better connected system and dedicated lanes like Detroit has, you know, showing the model of how we can get there. So this is um, about coming together and supporting these cities, supporting these leaders, supporting Wayne County so that we can undo a lot of these, what I call transit knots. This is a Melanie Piana explanation um, <laughs> that our region is like a, a bunch of knots on a rope and that rope is all clustered on the floor <laughs> and Oakland County by doing opt-outs removed a knot. Wayne County removing opt-outs removes a knot. And so we are improving the system one block at a time or one knot at a time. And that's where you come in. And I have a question for all of you. How many of you emailed or contacted your local official recently to let them know that you wanted A transit and B safer streets and came out for a project in your community? Thank you. Thank you. County Executive uh, Warren Evans needs to hear from you. Um, Councilman Benson and everybody on Detroit City Council needs to hear from you, but all these local officials in these suburbs need to hear from you too, because we all have to work together to get there. Excellent, thank you, Mel. And I'll, and I'll add to that, uh, and your state legislators. Um, I know a lot of yeah. folks have, uh, we've been doing a lot of reach out. We have a lot of uh, wonderful state legislators who are really in, who, who say yay transit, but now we need them to know it's a priority for their community and that they need to invest in it. So, um, so yeah, definitely make sure that yeah, you if, are contacting if we could, your legislator. If we could just say that when you talk, call your state legislators, yes. tell them you support the amendment of public <laughs> act 196 of 1986. That's what we're working on. Um, We've got a lot, I, I wanna bring Ray back in and, and take some of the questions we've gotten from the audience uh, and invite any or all of you, uh, well, probably a few of you uh, for, for each question to answer. Um, and I switched gears based on your last, com uh, your, uh, you were talking Mel about BRT. Uh, Shane from Detroit had said, we often hear about bus rapid transit as the quintessential solution for rapid transit in Detroit and its metro areas. Uh, curious, your thoughts on BRT, and if the Detroit area were to move forward, how uh, can we avoid the pitfalls of other cities that have had BRT creep systems, like regular buses with fancy branding? Uh, and how can we actually achieve a system that scores gold ranking uh, in the BRT standards, like so many places in Mexico, Central America, South America? So yeah, maybe if we can have Ray start, and then if any of you guys want to add in as well, how do we make BRT uh, what's your thoughts on it and how do we make it great? Um, so, uh, so I did do a video on BRT recently because, well, I was living in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which I think the Albuquerque Rapid Transit along Central Avenue there, which is the old Route 66, um, at least at the time it was implemented, it was probably the top-notch BRT system in the country. It had, it had everything. Um, that the, was it, the Institute for Transportation Development and Policy looks for when they're doling out silver, gold, bronze. It, it qualified for gold rating at, um, at, the, at the design level. It's got, it had center, center running, um, off-board fare payment, um, signal priority at all the intersections, dedicated lanes for like at least 90% of the corridor. Um, and so as a consultant, I worked on several BRT projects in the Portland, Oregon area, and all of them 
had that kind of mission, that, that mission creep aspect to them where they were originally envisioned as having all those same features, right? Because the idea is you want it to function as much like a grade separated rail as you possibly can by zipping it right through the signals, having limited stops and having off-board fare payments. So the dwell, dwell times are really low and it doesn't get stuck in traffic, right? But the, every project I worked on got bogged down in concerns over traffic and can we really give up parking? Um, and so by the time the project went to construction, it was curb running with kind of limited stops, nice shelters, good branding, but really often getting stuck in a lot of the same traffic that, that the regular buses are getting, um, getting stuck in. So I think the difference for Detroit, and I mentioned this earlier, is you really do have so many streets that, I mean, to my mind, and, and, and you know, I guess if you're driving at rush hour, maybe you perceive it differently, but a lot of them really seem overbuilt to me. And it seems like there's a lot of opportunity um, to reallocate uh, right of way um, to provide that kind of level of service on, on the four corridors that, that we're talking about here. Um, so I haven't, I haven't explored all of those corridors extensively, so I can't really speak, speak to that. But, but my general sense um, with roadway infrastructure in general, the Detroit region is that it was built for a metro area of like 10 or 15 million, and, and there's a lot of space that can be reallocated. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, the RTA envisions that future of all the BRT aspects you just mentioned and really the, you know, the question I heard is how do we get there? Um, the RTA has a regional transit master plan and it says we're going to build BRT on the four quarters that I've mentioned. Um, the real opportunity right now that is still in front of all of us is the bipartisan infrastructure bill it still has uh, two more years of two and a half years of funding remaining and the RTA um, submitted last year one of the largest applications for bus rapid transit along the four quarters. Unfortunately, we did not get it, um, but we did get technical assistance from US DOT to go back and try again. And um, the corridor, the furthest along to ready for BRT is Woodward Avenue. And um, the other corridors are also working very hard to meet the needs of the US Department of Transportation. Um, to go after the next level. There's planning, there's design and engineering, there is environmental review. I also like to say the RTA is navigators of transit complexity and oh my gosh, the US DOT is transit complexity. So that's why we're here as part of our plan, fund, coordinate and accelerate as your partner with all these other agencies and government levels to navigate this complexity together. And we are, working now again to go after more grant funding to accelerate engineering and design on Woodward um, as the next step. So we're blocking and tackling each corridor as we can um, and really working with all those communities and leaders along each one. Now, I asked, you all have a sense of urgency. Elected leaders have a sense of urgency. I have a sense of urgency, but that process is not urgent in navigating. And so it takes time and effort to go through. So there is progress being made and um, hopefully we'll unlock some more grant funding for Woodward Avenue and these corridors, but it takes Grand Rapids, the bus rapid transit in Grand Rapids, I, I think took like five to six years from planning to starting to put implementation on the ground. And that's where we are. It, take, it took five years to put those bike lanes in Ferndale, just bike lanes. So think about bus rapid transit, and that's what we're trying to navigate, and that's the next step, blocking and tackling together. Do you guys have anything particular you want to add on that, or should we move forward? So for me, it's going to take culture shift. So when we talk about the ability to make this level of change, it also means that elected officials have to buy in. And when we talk about bus rapid transit, we talk about a three or four county solution, which then means you have to have elected officials at the county level that support that. And we don't have that. And so this is where you all come into play. 
And so if you all want to see these changes, you all at a certain point will have to be prepared to step up and take on public service and then run for some of these seats or okay, ensure okay. those who hold the seats support regional transit and at the micro level support bus rapid transit. So you all are also part of the solution, but it also means that you have to lean in and demand that from your elected officials. And I just want to take the opportunity to acknowledge one of my bosses, Cunningham, who has come <laughs> today. And so he is an advocate. And so I just got to acknowledge him. And Cunningham, if you would stand up quickly. And so not only has Cunningham come to public comment in the city of Detroit, and he demands quality transit from all of all, all the council persons. He gives out bus passes. He has people call into public comment. He leans in. He has taken each council person on a personal curated bus ride from Macomb County into Detroit, at least for my route, on, on, on our FAST system to make sure people understand how transit services are utilized at the elected level. Because oftentimes we don't take the time to take public transit unless we lived in a city where it was really viable. And in our reality, it's not viable. I guess on the county level, it'd be even less viable to say, I'm gonna to go to a community meeting in Canton and then make my way back downtown to my office, or for me to take the bus after work out to the east side of my district, then to the west side for community meeting, and then back and then go pick up my son from school. I mean, it's just, unfortunately, is not often a viable form of transit, but we have to get on and we have to understand how it works because so many of our residents and our, and I call them my bosses, rely on public transit in their daily lives. I was gonna save this until till the end, but um, yes, um, uh, True has, uh, if you look on our website, we've got a whole set of questions. Uh, folks who are running for office, uh, you, can, you can find on our site a list of who's running, uh, and ways to contact them and uh, sample questions you can ask. The time that elected officials pay the most attention, the good elected officials are listening all the time, <laughs> but during campaigns is when they are especially listening um, and really wanna know what people think. So use this campaign season to ask every candidate for uh, office, local, regional, state, federal, they all have impact on transit and mobility, uh, so ask them, quite, ask them what are you going to do uh, to make sure we have great transit. Um, and that, uh, Cunningham's an amazing advocate we are thrilled to work with. Uh, True is also taking lots of state legislators out on bus rides um, so that they can have the experience. And there's actually a national push the first week of October uh, called Week Without Trans, or uh, Week Without a Car. Um, uh, in which uh, it started up in the Pacific Northwest, I believe, but, but challenging um, especially elected officials and other uh, transportation decision makers. Uh, if you can get around for a whole week, excellent, but even to get around for a day, uh, especially for the folks who don't regularly do it, uh, to really experience what it's like. So uh, yeah, since you already brought all those up, I figured I would add on. Um, and then the other piece you had mentioned fed, fed, fed into, I think the question I got most often, both from people who emailed uh, them in ahead of time and several of the cards, uh, do you think it's possible for the Metro Detroit area to heavily invest in transit while being the motor city and having a strong, strong car culture? Um, can we overcome that? Motor City identity, is there a conflict or how do we change the culture to recognize that, uh, I mean, my personal opinion, just because you have a cell phone doesn't mean you don't use email or text or the postal service. Having a car doesn't mean I can't also bus and bike and, and transit. How do we shift that culture? I'd love to invite Ray and, and any of you to talk a little bit about how we build the culture to embrace these options. Oh, I'd rather listen. Okay. <laughs> so again, since I'm holding the mic, I'll go first. Um, you know, we are the Motor City, and we're proud of that. I mean, that's what put us on the map. Uh, but as uh, as we evolve, we have to kind of look at the environment that we're in and what makes sense. Uh, to own a car these days is expensive. You know, four or five hundred dollar car payment. Two three hundred dollars insurance, another two three hundred dollars in fuel. You're up close to a thousand dollars. 
there's got to be creative a month. Yeah. There's got to be creative ways, right? And, you know, having the transit system uh, in place now, it's not a car, it's a bus, but it's still an automobile. And, uh, and, and what I see in vision as the, the transit here, if I could look in the future, right, 10, 15 years from now, is connecting the entire region together, right? Wayne, Oakland, Macomb, Washington, where you could, you could leave here and get to Ann Arbor very quickly if you want it. You can leave here and get to Oakland County very quickly to go visit uh, the city of Ferndale, you know, and, and enjoy those walking districts. And what we're seeing now here in the region is Wayne County uh, last year, we invested some of our ARPA dollars that we got through the American Rescue Plan Act into the Joe Lewis Greenway. And, um, and when you look at the Joe Lewis Greenway, if you haven't checked it out yet, you got to look into it. Like the first time I heard about it, I said, this is going to be a game changer for the entire region. And it's a 26 mile loop in the city of Detroit that essentially took old railroads that were not being used, abandoned areas, areas where people gonna go in and dump their waste and now has turned it into a walkable park where residents could go leave their, leave their home, go right in their backyard and they're walking to a park space and enjoy a nice walk in a community. And everywhere I go in this country and I travel, wherever you have walkable communities and you have good transportation, you always have safe communities. You know, people always feel safe where there's other people. And when there isn't any other people and you walk into a place, you're walking on the street and you're the only person walking, you don't naturally feel safe. And you know, my background's law enforcement and it's something that I always tend to, to pay attention to, but you know, I definitely believe we could break out of that stereotype of being the motor city and, and having bus services. I don't know if the high speed rails are a thing here. Maybe it could be buses and a lot of them and reliable buses that come on time and come up. To, so. Excellent, yeah, I think that's an excellent point. So I'm just gonna say, having the motor city, we will always be the motor city and we will always be proud of that. That would, you'd have to fight people to take away that moniker for the city of Detroit and the region, but it's not a zero sum game. And so successful municipalities and regions embrace transit. They embrace multiple modes of transit and looking at the demographics in this group as an age, you all are making the region rethink how we embrace public transit because our younger demographics who are now in the workforce, they don't want to own a car. They want to be able to walk. They like the ability to have walkable, safe, fun, active communities. And having a car isn't always there. When I hire people now, I ask them, do you have a vehicle? Because I need you to be able to get to different meetings. And sometimes I can't hire somebody if they don't have that, which also means that I lose the ability to have talent in my office because of we don't have that public transit option here in the city of Detroit. So you all are gonna change the region and make sure that public transit becomes a base. Because if we wanna survive and thrive as a region, we have to have reliable transit and transit. And I say this all the time at the table, our public transit cannot be the transit of last resort. We have to make it. <laughs> So that everyone wants to get on and use it because it's reliable. And as Asad said, it's safe and it's a place that you want to be. And so there are so many ways to make that happen. It's not a zero sum game. And you can't, some people just can't get away from a car. If I've got young kids, that's, that's just not a viable option for me to take my children, unless I have to, and people do. But when you have the resources, you're not gonna put your kid on the bus when it's zero degrees outside in the snow, you're gonna take a car. And I'm hoping that we can also provide the resources for all of our families to be able to have that as well. But when you can, it's far more convenient to be able to take public transit. And so it's not a zero sum game and you all will help us get there. I think everybody here has said that very eloquently, uh, we're more than one thing and we can do more than one thing because we have done more than one thing. And I believe that our region is known as mobility innovation. That is really what is being pushed right now. And I always say, well, transit is part of the mobility innovation. And we can innovate 
better together to bridge this divide and give a little bit more space to safe experiences for people for people getting to and from where they need to go via the options that are best for them. But we need to create the safe environments and the safe infrastructure and the infrastructure to even do that. And so we're um, making progress in small ways across every city and in big ways, um, like with the county doing um, the opt-in effort. And I applaud that because um, I've seen, we've all seen the difference in what's happening in Oakland County because of it. So ultimately, this is about strengthening connections between, again, people and places. That is our like North Star. And we're going to do that one project at a time um, so that we start building out um, the network because it all matters. And cars, people, streets, bikes, um, transit can all live together in harmony because we see it do in other places and we can do it here and we have the innovation to make it happen. Um, I, I, lo I love the question and I'm really glad that I listened to the other responses <laughs> first because I really like- We got a lot of smart people up here. No, yeah, like I, I like a lot of what I heard. I mean, um, car ownership is, a massive burden for, I mean, there are, there are a lot of people who, who don't make a lot of money who live in the city of Detroit, right? And and if you require them to own a car in order to be gainfully employed, um, it's uh, like like the, the math just kind of doesn't work out for a lot of people. Um, so we really do need other options. Um, and, and the question really gets to, like when, when I make a video, and I will make a Detroit video, probably, come out in like three weeks or something like that. And what I always try to do is like, I don't know, like I need some structure for it and themes and like the really obvious theme is it's the Motor City, right? And that doesn't just mean, you know, this is where the car was developed, right? That was adopted <laughs> worldwide. It, it doesn't just mean that. It also means um, it, it, it's a city that was also designed to make driving as easy as possible. I mean, most American cities were, right? But maybe maybe Detroit um, made, that, made that was at front of mind um, even more here than, than other cities. Um, so it's, it's something I've thought about a lot as I walk around and look at the design of the streets, um, the way the city's laid out, and how relevant is that today? I mean, like you said, it's always gonna be the motor, motor city, right? What else are the Pistons gonna put on their like city jerseys, right? <laughs> it's just, that's just what it is. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> they could do that. Um, yeah, and, and so, so, so I'm just just kind of fascinated by that whole theme. And I, I guess I would just add that, um, you know, there was a time, and 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 some state DOTs or or city DOTs still do this, where you're trying to make driving as easy as possible, right? And so that informs the way you design your streets. But the flip side of that is, when more people are biking or walking or taking transit. That makes driving better too, honestly. Um, like, there's, there's fewer people you're competing with for uh, for general general purpose lane space, then then it's just gonna make it an easier drive. So, excellent. A lot of good good uh, thoughts there, um, and I really I really like to think one one of the the things that really stands out to me in terms of how do we change the the culture is you got to have the right infrastructure. I mean, there's a set of us who will get out and walk and ride and bike even when it's not the easiest to do. But um, one of the most important things uh, to do to get more people using it is to make it better. So, uh, I mean, True's been fighting for, for a long time to get, heck, to get all the buses to show up on time. Um, as we improve the infrastructure, as we make it uh, a more friendly place to walk and bike, It'll take a while, but I think we can and are slowly changing that that culture, that idea. Um, so uh, I wanted to uh, another one of these questions about. Um, well, uh, yeah, Matt uh, asked, do you think Woodward Avenue uh, and parts of the downtown area should be completely pedestrianized, maybe allowing just the queue line through? Uh, have you seen successful areas with a lot with, with just pedestrian streets? Uh, and do you think it would be great here? Uh oh. Let's talk about that. Go on. Uh, 
<laughs> Do you have thoughts? Or you have... have I seen that? I'm, I'm trying to figure out where I've seen that in the U.S. I've definitely I, I spent. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Times. I mean, I mean, there are pedestrianized streets. I'm trying to think of ones that have have like streetcars or, or, or rail running through them. Also, that's something I've definitely seen. And uh, I spent a few months in Spain and Portugal last year. What was that spot um, about? At PSU. Denver. Yeah, right. a little bit, like maybe a block or two, yeah. or it's or it's uh, pedestrian only. Yeah. 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 We got a block. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we got to start. You had a lot of non-motorized areas during the jazz festival too. I think, so. Yeah, we really encourage them to get get here in time for the jazz fest um, to see. During big festivals, we close down a lot of areas. I mean, certainly uh, when uh, the NFL draft was here, tons of people were loving walking around downtown. Maybe that is something that could become a. Uh, a more regular occurrence. If I, was, I was living in Las Vegas when they had the draft there in 22, I think, and they shut down part of the part of the strip, um, which is extremely weird. I think the only other time they did that, a few months later, they did it um, for the Aces Parade when they, they won their <laughs> first championship. So. Yeah, other thoughts, yeah. Um, if you don't know, the RTA is acquiring the queue line, so we will be um, our board, I think, will be approving that transfer agreement next week. And um, the streetcar service is so important to downtown Detroit um, and the people of uh, Detroit. So visitors alike coming in the downtown. Um, I'm going to wear my urban planning point of view here in that um, not all streets can be pedestrian oriented. And I will tell you, Woodward, putting Woodward on a pedestrian oriented street other than the part in Detroit across from uh, City Hall on Lernib uh, will be very challenging. What the RTA and with partnership with the Q line, which has really improved transit, is the dedicated lane for the Q line on Woodward. And I think you're going to see come more out of the RTA is advocacy for dedicated lanes for travel, for bus rapid transit in the future, and bus services now. Um, and I think that is part of the infrastructure that people will see in immediate. Um, increase of speed of the buses getting through um, the travel traffic lights. Um, so we're blocking and tackling and trying to do all these things over time to improve um, the experience of taking transit. So uh, probably not more on Woodward, but um, smaller streets elsewhere that are connecting parks in the downtown have the potential to do that. Um, so. Pat, did you want to add it? So this is done around the world. So I'm not sure how many people have been to Copacabana Beach in Brazil. And on Sundays, half the boulevard is turned into pedestrian pathway. And the entire city comes down to the beach with their families and their kids. They exercise, they go to the beach. And the bus system, it transitions and it accommodates that. If you've been to the East Village in New York City, and I'm not, I have not been there for a number of years, but when I would go there in the early 2010s, you would have the East Village on during the weekday, they would shut down traffic to vehicles at 5 p.m. And on the weekday, on the weekends, it would be 24 seven pedestrian only traffic. And that is a very dense and vibrant area with residential as well as commercial and it works. And so it can work, it doesn't have to be all of what we're, I mean, our one block was a huge fight to get there because it's, it's a paradigm shift. You have to get people to shift their paradigm. And if you did that in the neighborhoods, just think about the quality of life and the change you would have. So it doesn't have to be a major street like what were a grash it. It can be your nice commercial residential nodes within certain communities. And if the residents want that type of quality of life, and so many of them do, make that offer. You all can also demand that. Say, hey, we live in this neighborhood. We'd like to see it car free for Saturday and Sunday, or we like you to cut off access to vehicles after a certain time during the week. Talk to your elected officials. They're the ones that can make that happen. And I just wanted to give a shout out too, when we talked about infrastructure and educating elected officials, Mayor Piana and I at the time, I believe this was the summer of 21, we co-hosted a bike ride for green infrastructure and for non-motorized transit. And so we led a ride from the fashion mile, seven mile, and Livernois into um, Pleasant Ridge along our Livernois um, bike lanes 
from Detroit into Ferndale, into Pleasant Ridge to show elected officials. And we had county officials, we had city officials, we had judges. We wanted to ensure everybody saw what non-motorized pathways can look like and how we can have an impact on a neighborhood. And so you saw the huge investment that was coming along the Fashion Mile in Detroit. You saw how once an industrial corridor in Ferndale had been transformed into a more commercial corridor and revitalized. You saw how the residential area in Pleasant Ridge was still very high quality. And so they were able to get a different look and a different view of bike lanes versus what they always saw and heard about. And we partnered with MoGo. And so we were able to make that happen, but it also came from educating your elected officials. They understand what it can look like from the ground level, from the grassroots. Excellent. Well, we could keep going uh, all night with, 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 we've got so many great questions. We are gonna have to wrap up shortly, but it wouldn't truly be a, 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 a nerd event about cities if we didn't talk about parking. Um, <laughs> I know, I can't help it. Uh, actually, we'll blame Joe in Detroit had said, um, Detroit already has abolished parking minimums in its downtown area, but large sections of the city uh, still remain, uh, still have tons of surface lots and structured parking. Uh, do you know of cities that are taking a more active role in reducing space dedicated to parking? Um, and what are they doing? So I think that was first to Ray, but then if others wanna add in thoughts on um, parking, so I, I just want to say that surface parking lots are part of my bane when it comes <laughs> to downtown Detroit. Just because I believe the last number I looked at was about 40% of the land downtown is surface parking lots. Yeah. And that is such a huge waste of productive land. How many of you have seen Caddyshack when he lamented the fact of cemeteries and golf courses were huge wasters of land? <laughs> you should build condos there. Not saying you should build condos there. But we need to bring those surface lots into productive use. It's just a big waste. But also in parking, if you look at Chicago, they now have whole districts where you will have a 10-story building and you will require like 10 parking spots for that building because they're saying if you want to live here, you know you will not have a parking spot. We're going to have shared um, parking spots and maybe some loading zones. But in our reality, if you're going to live in this area, you're not going to have a car. That's the, not the lifestyle that we want you to have. And we are looking at how we can reduce the need for vehicles, but we'll also create an environment where you don't have to have a car to live here. And so you're looking, seeing Chicago. I can't think of any others that are doing that, but I mean, the cost of parking and as who's read the Robert Shute book regarding uh, parking, the, uh, high the, cost was it, of free parking, the high cost of free parking. And so you just look at what it actually costs. And what does a parking spot cost today to build in the structure? I think it's like $40,000 yes. to build a parking Perfect. spot. You've got people that condo parking spots in other cities because of the value. And so just to have the car, you're $12,000 a year to own a vehicle. And then on top of that, I've got to spend another $6,000 a year to actually house my vehicle. I'm spending now $18,000 to own a car. I mean, some people can do that. I can't do that. <laughs> so th that is how and why people will choose not to and how we're going to prioritize revenue generating, tax generating space over surface parking lots, which are huge waste wasters of that. I, I always said, um, if I knew that when I ran for office that the number one issue I was going to deal with uh, more than any was parking. Um, I may not have ran. Um, um, I can say that now I'm not elected, uh, but parking is uh, the always development, new housing, new transit, anything always comes down to parking, uh, particularly in the entering suburbs. And what I wanna say about this, cause Scott covered it all, is that the cities, on the suburb, entering suburb cities, I'm not gonna talk about Detroit specifically, the challenge elected officials have with creating new affordable housing near transit stops is that the demand for more parking to support that housing, residents are asking to subsidize parking when the city could redirect 
that money for parking into actual more housing. Mm -hmm. But the transit system um, and how we fund transit puts the burden on local officials to solve this problem. And so it puts these decision making for each development project that comes up onto these officials to navigate the parking question. If we had more reliable, more higher frequency bus service, um, we can now shift the conversation as part of the culture shift to investing in what matters more in that community. Um, but we're always the vying over more parking. And um, there really is a concern with business owners too. And I don't want to disregard that um, of getting customers who are regional into their area, to their business. And so these are the balances of parking that are, are needed. But I'm like with Scott, um, I call all parking decks parking prisons um, <laughs> and um, parking creators um, because they are so expensive to build and maintain over time. Um, so yeah, obviously all these things are connected. Um, so the first time I ever did any kind of, I don't know, uh, like the, the first time I ever like did sort of a sponsored thing on my channel is for the Parking Reform Network, um, which is a national organization um, that, that supports and advocates for and provides tools for local jurisdictions to work on um, removing parking mandates. Um, and that's great. And I, I think the reason I support it is, I mean, I know the organization, I know, I know the people and I know, um, I know where their heart is and, and I think it's an, a hugely important issue. And I also think th there are a lot of things in the urbanism world that can be pretty divisive. Bike lanes can be divisive, right? Parking reform has the potential to be a lot less divisive than a lot of things, just because um, it also appeals to a certain um, kind of libertarian streak uh, in, in, in the politics um, because you're telling, you're telling landowners, um, you know, if, if, if we're repealing parking mandates, that means you can build however much parking you think you need in order to sell your project, right? You don't have to build the parking we told you to build. You decide for yourself, right? Which should theoretically result in less parking footprint and more of the footprint of, of the property having structures on it, right? More housing units or, or commercial or, or whatever. Um, but again, everything's connected. And so if you don't have other travel options, if you don't have frequent transit or biking, then they're still probably gonna have to build as much parking as they would have anyway, right? Because they can't envision having people living in their space who aren't gonna own a car because there just aren't other realistic options. Um, so parking reform can only go so far, right? You have to be working on the other things as well. Excellent point. Yeah, these, thing, these things are definitely all, all interconnected. Uh, you can't do any, any one without the other. Um, I think this one is less of a question, more of an invitation. Uh, so I'll uh, wrap with, with this one. The Gordie Howe Bridge opens in the fall of 2025. It will have actually a bike and pedestrian path. So inviting you. So we hope that sometime after the fall of 25, you'll come back and ride a bike with us uh, over to Canada. Uh, it'll be a cool opportunity there. I do. That sounds I, awesome. We'll <laughs> I, I do want to take. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, I was going to uh, ask each of you to make just a few closing remarks. Um, I loved how you were saying, Ray, that you, you, you got to kind of be a glass half full uh, person to, to do well to you on your videos. And I think to be an elected uh, or official or to be in social change advocacy or in government, you've got to be something of a, a half, cla half glass, glass half full person. Uh, so yeah, if you guys want to make a, a few closing remarks on what are you excited about? What do you suggest for the future in Detroit? Uh, or what are you guys excited to, to see happen in the, in the coming, in the future? Yeah, I'll just say a couple words and hand it off to the people who actually know what they're talking about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's true that, uh, like, I do have to keep kind of a glass half full view because I, I tend to, sometimes I go international, sometimes I talk about Canada and Mexico, but usually I'm talking about U.S. cities. And people trash U.S. cities just in general. Um, 
people talk down about our urbanism or whatever, and I understand some of that, but I like to, I like to kind of flip that on its head and, and talk about the things that are moving in the right direction or the ways that US cities have gotten things right broadly. Um, and I like to highlight places that I think are great places, great places to live where you can live a high quality of life um, without a car. Uh, because I mean, that's what, that's what I've been doing for, for several years now. Um, and while at the same time acknowledging that, uh, that's not always easy, um, uh, right. Not everybody has the luxury or the, the wherewithal, um, to pull that off because everybody's got like a different family or job or health situation. Um, but I think, um, I like to focus on the parts of U S cities that, where you, where you can have those things and where it can still be affordable to live car free. And oftentimes with our housing affordability crisis kind of nationwide, it's harder and harder to find those places. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I'd, I'd rather listen to other people talking about Detroit. <laughs> right um, I wanna say thank you for doing your videos. As, an, as a former elected official, I actually, found these education videos really critical in helping teach residents about what could be possible. Um, and this is how it works. And these videos are really important. So keep making them and thank you. Um, what I'm excited about, um, I think, is the change in the political under environment um, at the state level and the federal level of policy really pushing for more investment in transit and safer streets. Um, which means that there is this federal support that the state can tap into um, to help rethink and reset how we fund um, transit. I'm excited by this because the RTA is well positioned to take advantage of that on all behalf of all the transit providers and us as part of our plan, fund, and coordinate and accelerate role. It feels different now. I feel um, really optimistic. And it's not about... Um, do we need better transit? It's now about how do we do it and how do we get there um, and release, I call it release funding from the state in a more meaningful way, um, mm -hmm. which is what the RTA is trying to do right now with all of our partners. Thank you, Mayor. So, well, once a mayor, always a mayor. So two weeks ago, we took uh, a bunch of state legislators and uh, we met in one of the opt-in communities in Southgate. And, and, and we gave them what I would like to call the opt-out experience. We, we got on a bus, went through two opt-in communities, and then to get to our final destination, which was in Woodhaven, an opt-out community, we had to get off the bus and walk. And thank God for us, it was a nice dry day. And the walk was only one mile. I could have made a rare tough walk. We could have we could have taken a ride out to Can Township and had them walk for eight miles. But but I, I think if we would have done that, that law would have changed that day. You know. So, but the, you know the things that I'm excited about is honestly this is what I see as as the first big step is going all in a Wayne County. The one thing that I've learned in government is if you want like there's a lot of wisdom in simplicity right? Keep it simple and do it one step at a time. And once first step is to get all in. Once we get all in and we connect all our communities together, now we can connect the region together, right? Because Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb would be all in as well. Then all the investments that we're making in our park spaces and our walkable spaces are now connecting to one another. And then connecting those spaces to the transit system. Now think of Smart and DDOT and all the main bus lines as a macro transit. Currently right now in Lansing, the state legislator is also working on a uh, SOAR program where they're looking to invest an additional $200 million a year for the next 10 years into transit. And what I'm, and what I'm hoping for is, is the main bus lines will be the macro level and this money that will go after local communities and RTA and others could be the micro level, right? First mile, last mile, ride share, uh, bicycles, everything you could think of to get to the main line. 
these are the things that I'm excited about. And, uh, you know, there's two things I'm very passionate about. One's transit and the other's infrastructure and they both work together. So we're gonna do this. All right. And so I'm gonna take this time just to give some of the data that I didn't talk about and that I worked on for tonight. And I just want to talk about experience that I did have with Megan a number of years ago when True did something called Bosses Ride Buses. And so we left from Woodward and the goal was to get to the suburban show place in Novi. And we had a very similar experience. But at the time, Novi, uh, an opt-out community, meant that the bus line ended about four miles from the suburban showcase. We took two buses to get out there and then we had to hop in an Uber to get the rest of the way or walk. And I wasn't going to walk. So we hopped in an <laughs> Uber to do that. Understanding that everybody has the opportunity to do an Uber. And so we took the Uber to the, show, the showcase, looked around, said, this was terrible. We need to do something about this in the future. <laughs> and then we took an Uber back to the city because yeah. we were time challenged. Everybody has an opportunity, but being time challenged, but it did just highlight how terrible the, the experience can be for someone who's trying to get a job go to a uh, career fair at the Suburban Showcase, but then really not have the financial resources to get there. So this is a great eye opener. I hope that she'll do it again. But some of the things that we're really excited about in the city of Detroit is number one, with our transit systems, number one, we lead with equity. And then we wanna make sure that our transit systems are for everybody. And so there's a couple of things that we're doing. We got a $10 million um, project to update and upgrade and expand our bus shelters to ensure that our bus riders have a much better experience. And our goal is to get to 299 bus shelters and to modernize them with lighting, you did, um, charging USB ports, digital display with real time um, arrival um, information and just wanna enhance experience. Uh, we're having right now our East Jefferson Enhanced Corridor Pilot. That's a $4.8 million project. We now have 10 minute service on our bus line and we've now updated we're updating 21 enhanced stops with digital displays and they're also solar powered we also have our micro mobility partnership with mogo and so we're looking to have mogo throughout the city so that you can ride your bike from downtown on a mogo out to the fashion mile you can because you have about two or three mogo stations along seven mile and on Livernois to make that a possibility and you can get into ferndale because they and also and have and mogo stations and and so that's critical when it comes to mobility throughout the city of Detroit and throughout the region. And thank you for that, Mayor. We also we just uh, implemented a scooter ordinance to make sure that people have mobility, but doesn't become a bane or a impediment to those who have, who have trans with mobility challenges or to pedestrians uh, throughout the city. Um, we are now designing mobility hubs with our youth so that they can have a greater say in how transportation and mobility is handled in your neighborhoods. We have our autonomous vehicle pilot programs. Number one is accessibility D which is a transit system for our disabled and senior citizens who don't have access to vehicles, but they will be picked up by autonomous vehicles taken to grocery shopping or to the doctor's office by an autonomous vehicle. And so we're ensuring that every segment of the city has access to these cutting edge technology. In addition, we have our Connect Pilot, which is a free AV shuttle service along the uh, fixed route along the Jefferson Corridor. From the, uh, from the train station to the east side into the villages. It's along a fixed route. And so these are autonomous vehicles that we're piloting within the city of Detroit. And then lastly, we have our Detroit Modern, which is a $2 million federal grant, which is allowing us to utilize uh, data to identify high injury areas within the city of Detroit in our transportation system and to make the necessary investment and changes to bring those uh, injuries and collisions, motorized, uh, motorized versus versus non-motorized, motorized versus pedestrian, bring those down and use data to do that. And so these are just some of the things that we're doing in the city of Detroit right now on top of our half billion dollar investment into non-motorized pathways throughout the city of Detroit.
So there are clearly a lot of exciting things happening, a lot of efforts underway. We know we have a long way to go. Uh, it, uh, I like to look back to, in some ways, Detroit's heyday when it was growing the fastest in the 20s, 30s, 40s, um, was when we had the auto plants, but we also had streetcars uh, and people were walking and biking and people would take the streetcar uh, to their work at the plant and save their fancy new automobile for a Sunday drive. We can have a truly multimodal system. And a lot of our, our, our greatest uh, neighborhoods uh, were built around those streetcars. Uh, so you can have that, that, that density uh, and that uh, walkability that is possible. I think, yeah, Detroit may have swung the pendulum a little too far, way, way too far in the uh, auto focus, but we're moving back towards that, that medium where you truly have choices. But as we were talking about earlier, this does not just sort of magically happen. Uh, these are decisions. Um, we are blessed to have amazing officials who are working every day to, to make these improvements. So a big thank you to our officials here. But as I said, and they said, uh, we need a lot more uh, uh, elected and appointed uh, officials who, are, who really do recognize the value of walkable urban communities. So uh, I know there's at least a few people, I can't uh, necessarily call them out, but who are, who are running for office uh, already. And I encourage all of you to think about getting on your, your planning commission or uh, show up at those city council meetings. Um, even if you can't uh, be like Cunningham in there every single day, uh, you can still make your voice heard. Uh, so please, get involved at the, uh, in, in your local communities. And I also want to really invite everyone to get involved with TRUE. Uh, we are really focused on how can we make uh, the, the, the communities where everyone can get where they need to go. There's a thousand issues we wish we could tackle, uh, but we pick uh, two or three or maybe four uh, at any given time where there's the best opportunity for us to make a difference. So whether it is uh, working to convince our state legislature to yes, invest two billion or two billion dollars over ten years in uh, in public transit, in transformational transit projects. They need to hear uh, that this stuff's really important. So please join us in that call. Um, also working uh, at the at the local level. Just uh, and I actually want to pause and, and thank everyone who helped over the last two years to fight. Uh, for uh, better wages for bus drivers. We had a big win. It took a lot longer than it probably should have, but, uh, but both the DDOT and the smart bus drivers are getting substantial raises. Um, and hopefully that and continued efforts to make those those wages and those conditions uh, more appealing of, of a job, we can stop the no-show bus crisis that I know several people even dealt with today uh, of buses not showing up. So um, from the uh, local, uh, state, regional, federal level, we're obviously working closely with our, our Wayne County partners um, to make sure that we can expand countywide, but it takes everybody getting involved. So um, uh, please consider in addition to your ticket donation, so thank you for coming here today. Um, we have a monthly giving program. Can you make that five bucks you gave? Can you make it monthly? Um, or your th that $30, can you give it every month to help us uh, be able to, uh, to, to, to do this work day in, day out? Um, and also I invite everyone to get involved uh, in our volunteer team. Uh, if you didn't uh, meet Joel or Lucas on the way in, um, uh, uh, or if you didn't, if you haven't yet done that uh, survey of interests on our website, let us know that you're interested in volunteering. We have a, a monthly meeting where we can let you know about different ways to get involved. So um, I feel like there was something else. Anyway, I guess that's probably enough. What? Oh, yes. And what well, we did say, um, uh, yeah, make sure you're asking your candidates about transit, um, making sure that we are um, that they are hearing during this election time that, that it is a super important 
uh, issue to you. So um, I want to give another big thank you uh, to all of our speakers. Thank you so much, Ray, for joining us. We've got, a, we've got a little thank you for Ray and Art uh, in the stations of the Detroit People Mover. He managed to make it like the last two hours that the People Mover was running before it shut down. Yeah, uh, yeah I got downtown that. at like 6.30, I think, on Monday. It's like, and oh, it's, People Mover store. I should say, pausing operations for improvements, uh, pausing for 11 weeks to uh, improve the service. Um, it'll be back uh, in around Thanksgiving, but there is some amazing art. Uh, so we've got a lovely book for Ray. So thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Ray and panel for all that you do.